You're listening to a sermon preached at Grace Church of Orange, California. For more info about Grace, please go to www.graceorange.org. And now, join us as we go verse by verse through God's inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. Morning. Well, we are going to be in uh, Revelation chapter 2 this morning, if you'd like to start flipping over in that direction. And Landon already mentioned this, but um, our elders are at a retreat this weekend. And some of you have had way more church experience than I have, and you've been in different places, and so you know this, but uh, just be thankful for our elders. (laughs) We have a really neat group of guys that really love Christ. They love our church. They want to, to lead us in the right way. And so uh, pray for them. If you watch the headlines, you know that pastors and elders go down quickly, often. So pray for them. Um, just it, be grateful for them. <laughs> That's, I just wanted, wanted to say that. But uh, we are going to be in Revelation chapter 2 this morning. And Once you get over there, why don't you stand with me if you're able. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7. This is the the letter to the church in Ephesus. So we're in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you this morning for another opportunity to open your word and to see its richness and its depth and its beauty. And we pray this morning, Lord, that you would change us, that your spirit would work through the preaching of your word. Um, Lord, we want, we know that you're the king. And so we pray that you would rule and reign in your church through your word this morning. Help us to love you more and delight in you more. Help me to be clear and may your name be honored this morning in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, uh, there is a conversation that you all know how to have, and many of you just had it. And it goes something like, uh, hey, good morning. How's it going? Fine. How are you? Good. Yeah, things are good. And then you move on. We all know that conversation, right? Um, But have you ever thought, you know, what if, what if that question goes a little bit further? I have a really uh, a good friend that will ask me, how's your soul? Or maybe if you asked, how's, how's, uh, what's the health of your church like? And I just want to think about that with you. Have you ever thought, how do you measure the health of a local church? Or on the flip side, how, how do you measure your own spiritual health? Church is just a grouping of individuals, so how do you know if you're spiritually healthy? And there are all sorts of answers to these questions. Thinking first about uh, the health of a church. You got some people that say a church is healthy if, if it's got numbers. It's healthy if there's people. It's healthy if it's growing in numbers. It's healthy in that way. Some people kind of numbers, but on the money side. It's healthy if it has a big budget. It's healthy if it has no debt. That, that's what makes a healthy church. Some people might say the activity or the programs make a church healthy. They've got Awana, they've got VBS, they've got youth, they've got a prayer meeting, they've got, you know, you can list it off and keep on going. They've got summer camp, whatever it might be. That's, that's what makes it a healthy church. Some people might say it's social good. Uh, they, they do food drives, they help the homeless, they do things out in the community. 
Some people, I didn't really know what else to put on this one except our opinion. Some people, it's just, if it's right for them, if it's the right pastor and the right music and the right lighting and the church uses the right vocabulary, that, then that's a healthy church. Or maybe a little bit closer to home, we might say it's a doctrine that makes a healthy church. Good preaching, strong doctrinal statement, theologically rich songs. You know, we sing hymns, so we must be a healthy church. Uh, but then even thinking about your own spiritual life, what, what makes you, what's a measure of your spiritual health? And you've got some people that say, it's, it's my devotions, it's my devotional life. If I read my Bible and I pray, I'm, I'm healthy as a believer. Or it's my service. I serve in Awana, I serve in VBS, I serve on Sunday morning in the nursery, I serve everywhere that you can serve, and that makes me healthy. Or the moral behavior. I don't say certain things, I don't watch certain things, I don't listen to certain things, I don't go certain places, I'm, and therefore I'm spiritually healthy. Others might say it's knowledge. I, I've, I've got the right stuff in my head. I, I, I understand the Bible. I can explain it to someone. Therefore, I'm a healthy believer, I'm spiritually healthy. And then lastly, some people might say it's feeling. I just feel close to God, so I must be healthy. It just feels right. It must be. But this morning, the, the thing we're going to look at, there's something more foundational. And if you're a note taker, the, the one thing I, I have for you, it's not, there's not really... A, an outline is such this morning, but there's one thing. Love for Christ should be the measure of our spiritual health. All those things I mentioned are valid in some way. It, it's good. We, as a church, we should be doing social good. As a church, programs are fine. As a church, we better have good doctrine and hopefully good preaching and a strong doctrinal statement and all those theologically rich songs. Those are good. As a believer, you should serve. You should do devotions. You should grow in your knowledge. But at the bottom, at the rock bottom, love for Christ. So if you're going to take away one thing from today, what I want you to take away is this. Make loving Christ the primary measure of your spiritual health. That's what, that's, that's what I want you to get out of today. Make loving Christ the primary measure of your spiritual health and our spiritual health as a group, the church. And this really is the fundamental difference between believers and unbelievers. Remember James says in James 2.19, even the demons believe and what? Shudder. The demons know who Christ is. They know what he did on the cross. They know that he's God in the flesh. But they look at him and they hate him and they reject him. What makes someone a believer is that they look and they believe and in that belief they say, I love him. Now Peter describes a believer in 1 Peter 1.8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Is at the core of what it means to be a Christian, of what it means to be saved. So what we're going to do is we walk through these verses. Pretty simple. We're going to see the situation, the problem, the solution. Situation at the church, the problem with the church, and the, then the solution. So let's just start here in verse 1, and let's get a picture of this church in Ephesus. Chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? And so just right off the bat, that word angel, that word is literally messenger. And it can be a human messenger or a supernatural messenger. We normally think supernatural. Here, it really seems like this is a human messenger, probably a leader, one of the elders in the church in Ephesus, the one that would be delivering this letter that John is recording here. And so to the messenger, the leader of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And if you just look a few inches up in your Bible, this is explained for us. Jesus in, in chapter 1, verse 20, just a few inches up, says, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, the messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
Jesus says of those leaders, those messengers, that he is holding them in his hand. And it's a strong word. He is grasping. He has them. He will not let them go. And then he walks among his church. Jesus knows. He knows the hardships. He knows the difficulties. He knows what's going on in all of his people's lives. And he holds them and he has them. And he's walking and he's examining his church. And he's writing to this church in Ephesus. Let's just get a picture of this church in Ephesus. You've probably heard of Ephesus before if you've read your Bible a little bit. There's a letter to them, yes? Letter to the Ephesians. So just some data points. Let's just gather some things here. Uh, Don't flip back there, but in Acts, when the church is started in Ephesus, what you start to notice as you read through that is that Paul spent more time in Ephesus than any other church. More time there than any other church. Also, when he's going to Jerusalem, he makes a special stop in Ephesus to be able to talk to the elders. Acts chapter 20, he has this conversation with the elders of the church in Ephesus. Also, if you remember, his apprentice Timothy, he leaves him, guess where? In Ephesus. So he says in 1 and 2 Timothy, he says, stay in Ephesus, and then he writes two letters about how to run the church in Ephesus. You're getting the picture that this is an important, important spot. And then, if you've read the book of Ephesians, is it a theological lightweight or heavyweight? Heavyweight. It's like the, the peak of the New Testament in terms of density of theological material. It is a heavyweight book, theologically. So we've got to start asking ourselves, Why? Why? We're gathering some data points, and to get why, we we need to look at Ephesus just as a city as a whole. So Ephesus, think bustling, metropolitan, multicultural, multilanguage, with a trade route going through it. There's one one of the wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis. Big, huge temple, but probably most importantly, there's a large harbor in Ephesus. And so what Ephesus becomes is a little bit like, um, from our perspective, maybe like New York. If you want to go to Europe, you take that flight to to New York, and then you take the long one to Europe usually, right? It's that gateway city that you've got to go through. You jump, or maybe you jump, uh, we would never do this. We'd never take John Wayne to LAX. Well, you might take John Wayne to LAX and then go somewhere real far away. Uh, But it's the gateway. It's where you have to pass through. If you want to go to Rome to the west, you've got to go through Ephesus and then go out through there. If you want to go to Asia Minor and east, you go through Ephesus and you go through there. So you can see now what Paul knows. If you're a church planner and you have a network of churches, you have to secure Ephesus. You have to have a healthy church in Ephesus if you want the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. Because if you secure Ephesus, if you have a healthy church there, now you can go anywhere. And you've got people coming through, and what are they going to hear if there's a healthy church there? The gospel. So Paul knows, I've got to secure Ephesus. That's why he writes this dense theological letter. That's why he puts Timothy there. That's why he visits there for so long. He knows it's important. It's like risk. And sometimes you get that bottleneck city, and whoever has, you know, Irkutsk, Russia, or whatever it might be, you know, you've got to have that city. It's a little bit like that. And so it's a very important city. It's, but the church is described even more. We got a picture of the church, but it's described even more if you look down at verse two. Verse two. I know. Your works. This is Jesus talking to the church. I know your works. And look at the three he lists here. Your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. Toil, patient endurance, and they cannot bear with those who are evil. Let's look at each of these in turn. Toil. If you haven't used this tool, it might not make as much sense. But if you've used a post hole digger, that's what you should think of when you think of this word. Or if you've dug a ditch or used a wheelbarrow, think of someone laboring to the point of sweating, a farmer in the field wiping his brow. He's tired. This is a church that is working for the sake of the gospel. They're sharing their faith. They're building one another up. This is not a spectator church. 
in Ephesus. We get so used to watching in our culture, watching TV, watching whatever's on YouTube or the internet or watching Netflix, or we just kind of become spectators sometimes. That's not what this church was. They were involved. They were laboring to the point of sweat. And then you've got patient endurance. It wasn't just a burst of energy that they had. It wasn't that they were just... uh, sprinters, they were in it for the long haul. This is literally bearing up under a weight. Like when you see kids at school with their like 75 pound backpacks trudging around, this is what you should think of bearing, bearing a weight or going uphill or a weightlifter walking with a weight on his back. So they're, they're not just a church that works really hard for a short burst and then it's done. From the time that the letter to the Ephesians was written until John writes this letter is probably about 40 years. Church probably looked similar to us. Some old, some young, some families, some singles, all different walks of life, because this is a church that's been around for a while. They're in it for the long haul. They're not only toiling and serving, but they're doing it with patience. They're bearing up under the load of hardships and persecution and difficulty. And then lastly, notice it says in verse 2, you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. This is a discerning church. This is a discerning church. And they took doctrine seriously. They took false teaching seriously, as they should. And I want to just for a moment look at some verses with you because I'm always struck by the discrepancy between kind of how we, I mean, even, I would say that doctrinally we are, a church that is pretty strong on doctrine, and yet the way we talk about these things and then the language the Bible uses is kind of striking sometimes. So just a few here. Uh, 2 John 1, 11 says, it's talking about traveling uh, kind of missionary preachers at that time. It says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, that it's healthy, sound doctrine, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Galatians 1.8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, literally anathema, cast into hell. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And lastly, 1 Timothy 4.1, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. It's not a mess up. It's not a little bit off. Teachings of demons. And like I said, I'm not preaching this because I think we're doing a poor job as a church, but I think we need to be warned and be reminded that this can happen at any time, in any place. And sure, the elders are charged mainly with ensuring the doctrinal purity of the church, but it comes down to every one of us. It comes down to every one of us. Be careful what you're listening to. Be careful what you're watching. There's this great quote by a preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones. The heretics were never dishonest men. They were mistaken men. They should not be thought of as men who were deliberately setting out to go wrong and to teach something that is wrong. They have been some of the most sincere men that the church has ever known. What was the matter with them then? Their trouble was this. They evolved a theory, and they were rather pleased with it. Then they went back with this theory to the Bible, and they seemed to find it everywhere. It's just a warning there that we constantly need to be vigilant. We constantly need to be on guard, and we constantly need to uphold sound doctrine as a church. We should be the most welcoming, joy-filled, loving place. I'm not talking about being rude or harsh or mean, but I'm talking about being intent on keeping doctrinal purity. Okay, so this church, this church looked like a healthy church. So far, we've got toil for the gospel, patient endurance, discernment. This is a church that looks healthy. This is a church that had Paul minister there, that had Timothy minister there, that had John minister there. They had everything that you would expect for them to be a very healthy church, and it looks like they are. They've got the works. They've got the doctrine. Have you ever grown vegetables? 
I really like growing vegetables. And I remember t- talking with my dad in the backyard and sometimes asking, you know, you have, we would have uh, pepper bushes, little bushes of pepper, and asking, you know, why, why are there no peppers on this bush? Or why are they so small and dinky and not spicy? And he'd say, well, sometimes you do everything right. You water it, you have good soil, right amount of sunlight, everything looks good. But you just don't get fruit. Sometimes that just happens. And this is Ephesus. Looks good. It looks right. It should be right. But there's a problem. So that was the situation. We've seen the situation, and now we're going to see what the problem is. What is the problem? The problem in Ephesus. Verse 3, he kind of recaps what he has said. He says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. Note, note this here real quick. Uh, it's not only that they were doing all these things, it looks like they're doing them for the right motive. For my name's sake, in verse 3. It looks like they really wanted to honor the Lord and do it for his glory. And you have not grown weary. But then verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. That's the problem. And to make it even more tragic, you've got to go back and realize in the book of Ephesians, if you look for that word love, it's in every single chapter, most of them multiple times. So you've got phrases like in Ephesians 1, 5, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons. In 1, 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. Paul gives thanks for them because of their love. In Ephesians 1, in chapter 2, it talks about God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. In Ephesians 3, Paul prays that they would be rooted and grounded in love so that they may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's in chapter 4. It's in chapter 5. And saddest of all, the last verse of the entire book. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Gosh, it seems like they got it. Seems like, seems like at least at one point, they got this. They at least had plenty of teaching on it. That's all the more sad because of that. Now, if, we're gonna, if, if, if my argument today is that you should make loving Christ the measure of your spiritual health, that's the argument today, then we need to talk about how the Bible defines love. We kind of get a skewed view in our culture. And so when Paul or John or one of the biblical writers uses a word, they're often pulling on how the Bible has already defined it. And it's interesting. If you remember, Jesus talks about the greatest commandment. And he says, that, do what? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, yes? He's actually quoting from Deuteronomy when he says that. So let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Go ahead and turn with me this time. And I just want to talk for a little bit. If we're really going to love Christ, if we're really going to love God, let's do it by the definition that God gives in his word. Deuteronomy is the book that defines what it means to love God. That's what Deuteronomy is about. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'm going to read uh, verse 4 to about verse 9. Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What Deuteronomy is showing here and throughout the rest of the book is this. Loving God is choosing to give God the place of supreme importance in every aspect of your existence. 
Loving God is choosing to give God the place of supreme importance in every aspect of your existence. I'll try to say that maybe one or two more times as we go here, but look, look here. So you have, here are Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Him alone, no others, no one like him, no competitors, he is first. And then it says in verse five, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This is talking about your own person. In your own person, you will give God supreme importance in your thoughts, in your words, in your deeds, in what you hope for, what you dream for, what you think about, everything. God will have the place of supreme importance. And by the way, we're using that word choosing on purpose, because a lot of times when we hear the word love and we hear love Jesus or love God, we think that means that when I read my Bible or when I sing or whatever, I need to feel a certain feeling. That's, that's what love is, to feel a feeling. But what the Bible seems to describe and what Deuteronomy seems to describe is that it's more about choosing to give God this place of supreme importance. Feelings and emotions are good and helpful and right and useful and God-given, but they follow the decision of your heart to set your affection on him. So, Deuteronomy 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And now look here, verse 6 is awesome because it shows us how. How do I do that? How do I give God supreme importance in everything? How do I do that? And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. The way we give God the place of supreme importance is letting his words govern every aspect of our life. The question, anytime, anyplace, anywhere is, what does God say about this? What does God say about the situation? What does God say about this thought? What does God say about this matter? What What does it look like? Well, You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. God shall have the place of supreme importance in your discussions within your family, in what you choose to impart to your children, in what you say to them, in what you train them in. God and his words will have the place of supreme importance. You'll talk of them when you're in your house, God will have supreme importance. When you walk by the way, when you go out and do whatever God has called you to do, he'll have supreme importance importance in that. And when you lie down and when you rise, when you get up, when you sit down, God will have the supreme place. He will be above all. His words will govern all. That's what it is to love God. That's what it looks like. And look at this verse, uh, where are we at? Verse eight. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Write them on your hand so you don't forget. Put them between your eyes so you don't forget. Put them on your doorpost so you don't forget. Put them on your gate so you don't forget. To love God is to choose to give him the place of supreme importance in every aspect of your existence. And it, that's, that's what, turning back to Ephesus now, the church in Ephesus, that's what they were missing. I've felt it, you've felt it. Over time, things creep in. Other things want the place of supremacy. Other things want first place. They want our love, they want our affection, they draw our hearts. Can you imagine how sad it would be if your child or your spouse came to you and said, hey, I'll, I'll keep doing all the right stuff. Dad, I'll, uh, I'll clean up after myself. I'll do the dishes. I'll do the chores. Um, I won't whine and fuss. I don't even do it all with a smile, but I don't love you. I'm not going to. That would be devastating. You'd say, give me the love and scrap the rest of it. I don't need the rest of it. We can work on the rest of that later. But give me your heart. That's what God is saying here. And by the way, we're, we're looking at Deuteronomy. If you ever hear some, you'll hear this sometimes. You know, the Old Testament was God was harsh and he cared about what you do and it was all about works. And the New Testament is about grace and mercy and the heart. That is just rubbish. That it's been about the heart from the beginning. It's been about the heart all the way along. It's been about loving God from day one. 
All right, so the church in Ephesus, let's go ahead and just turn back to, to Revelation chapter two. So the church in Ephesus, they looked good. It seemed like everything was good. They had the right works. They had the right doctrine. They didn't have love. They didn't have their first love. So that was the problem. We saw a situation, the problem. Let's look at the solution now. I've said that we should make loving Christ the measure of our spiritual health. And it's wonderful because if you're here today and you say, this is me, that's me, you've described me, God gives us the solution. He gives us the steps. If you look in verse five, listen for the verbs. Remember therefore from where you have fallen Repent and do the works you did at first. Remember, repent, do. God gives us three, three really pretty simple ways to, to return to this first love. What do you do if you realize this is me? Remember, repent, do. Let's look at each of those. Remember, think back to when you were saved. Think back to when you realized hell is real. And I'm headed there, rightly. And then think back to when you realized, but there's someone that can save me. There's a way out. There's hope. Think back to when you realized how good God was, how good Christ is. I, wanna, I wanted to give like 50 of these reasons, but we're just going to do a few. Uh, because we don't have time for all 50. I want to give you a few reasons of why you should love Jesus. And there are tons more. And if you're a believer, this is meant to kind of stir you up and encourage you. If you don't trust in Christ, I know there's some of you here that don't. And I just want you to see, this is the one that we worship. This is, this is, what, this is a person that Christians are all about. And you can have all these things that I'm about to read be true of your life if you would trust him. So just some reasons uh, here. Love Jesus because he loved you first. We love God because he first loved us. That's like number one. It's simple. Love Jesus because he loved you first. You were running from him when he snatched you back, opened your eyes to the gospel, showed you the truth, placed you in that Christian family you grew up in, caused that thing to happen to you that brought you to Christ. I don't know your situation, but whatever it was, he loved you first. Love him because he rescued you. Colossians says he, he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. He rescued you. Love him because he loved you first. Love him because he rescued you. Love him because he made you right with God. Isaiah talks about this one that's gonna come that can stand in the place of his people and bear the full weight of God's anger against their sin and wipe away the filth of their sin. And Jesus was that one. 2 Corinthians says that not only did he take his sin on us, but he also purchased for us his righteousness. He made you right with God. He clothes you in his perfect, spotless righteousness. He loved you first. He rescued you. He made you right with God. Love him because of his nature, because of who he is. He's the exact imprint of of the Father. He has revealed the Father to us. He is good and righteous and holy and loving and joyful and perfect and courageous and humble and meek and gentle and loving and on and on and on. All in perfection, all at once. Love him just because of who he is. Love him because he'll never lose you. In John 10, he says that no one can snatch them out of my hand. Talking about believers. If you've trusted in Christ, he will carry you to the very end. He will carry you through to eternal joy forever. He'll never lose you. He is the good shepherd. He is the one that walks with us through the deepest, darkest valley. Praise him because he completes God's plan. We've, all these ones I've listed so far are vertical. 
my relationship with God. And we don't talk very often about the horizontal things that Christ does in making the world right, in making all of creation restored. But these next two are more horizontal in nature, and it's important that we we love Christ for these two. Love him because he completes God's plan. No one else could have done what he did. There was no one else that was God and man. No one else could have borne sin. No one else could have lived a perfect life. No one else will one day take the scroll from the Father's hand and claim the universe. No one else could say it was finished on the cross. He completes God's plan to forgive people who are unrighteous while keeping God righteous. And lastly, he makes the world right. I'm going to talk about this a lot, but Genesis 49 says that the king that will come, the Messiah, he's going to restore creation so completely that grapevines, if you've seen them, they're little tiny vines for the most, at least the ones I've seen. The grapevines will grow so strong and thick that you could tie a donkey to it, like a tree. It says that wine will be so plentiful you can bathe in it. End of water scarcity, end of famine, end of world hunger. None of those come until King Jesus comes, but he will do that. Isaiah talks about how the king that comes, it says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. You want world peace? Jesus is the only king that has the power and the goodness to bring that about. It also says in Isaiah that this one will write all justice, injustice and oppression Crime, fraud, human trafficking, all of it won't be made right except through Jesus. And lastly, Isaiah talks about how when this king comes, you might have heard the phrase, the wolf will lie down with the lamb and the the child will put his hand on the adder's den or the cobra's den. Creation was created to be a man hugger and it's broken, but it'll be set right. Not just that all of uh, all of the, there'll be no more famine or hunger, or any of that, but all of creation, even the animal kingdom will be set right under this king and he makes us right with God. He does it all. He's worthy of love. Worthy of love. He loved us first. He rescued us. He made us right with God. Love him for his nature. Love him because he'll never lose you. Love him because he completes God's plan and because he makes the world right. So remember. Remember and then secondly, Repent. Remember and then repent. The idea of the word repent is a complete 180 degree change of direction. So this is saying, Lord, this thing that I was doing, this thing that I was loving, this thing that I was giving a place of importance in my life, I realize it's wrong, it's evil, I don't want it anymore. It might have even been a good thing, but it was taking the place of you and I want to turn away from it. Please help me. Do you ever think about, kind of transforms how you, Read your Bible and pray. Do you ever think about confessing and repenting for lack of love? It's actually really freeing because watch. Say you're reading your Bible every day and you're spiritually dry as a bone and it's difficult and it's hard. If, if we never call it sin, sin, then what happens it, if we don't call sin, sin, we have no out. I'm dry. I don't know what to do. It's not working. But once we, once we say, Lord, it's sinful that I'm not responding the way I ought to, that I'm not loving you the way I ought to, that I'm not giving you the place of supreme importance in my life. Would you help me? Would you change me? Now all the wealth of God's power is open to you when you confess that sin. And now he says, I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will give you joy. But until, if we're not willing to repent, all of that is shut off from us. And so we should be quick to repent. Lord, forgive me for not loving you. Forgive me for not responding the way I ought to, to how glorious and beautiful and wonderful you are. It transforms the way we read the Bible. And notice how no more, it's not a checkbox thing. I read my Bible today because that's what Christians do. No, it's, I love him. I want more of him. Lord, I'm praying because I need you and I I need you to help me love you and it transforms how we think about coming to our devotions and coming to God. The last thing, and we we need to move here. Remember, repent, do. This isn't some command to just 
do, do things with the wrong heart, but if you have the right heart, if you've repented, if you've confessed, do the things that you did. What did you want to do when you were first saved? What, what excited you? What were you excited about? Go back and do those things. Go back and do those things. And so coming down now, we come in verse 6. We already mentioned this a little bit. This is another commendation of the discernment of the church. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. They were a discerning church. And now, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen up, basically. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Heard of the tree of life before? Where? Genesis 1. He's saying, keep on enduring. I know the difficulty that you have. Return to your first love. Repent. Remember, do the works at first, and we'll go back to Eden and better in the new creation. We'll, we'll go back. It will be right. That king will set everything straight. That king will make us right with God. We will walk with him again. Keep on enduring. Keep on toiling. And keep on remembering and repenting and doing those first works. And we will have eternal joy with him to look forward to. Amen? And All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you that you're so patient and kind with us. Lord, I... Forgive me for my own lack of love for you. This is such a convicting passage. And we pray that even now you would encourage our hearts with it, that you would give us the motivation and the strength and the drive to press on to know you more and to love you more. Lord, I haven't loved you as you ought for even one millisecond of my existence, but I'm looking forward, we are looking forward to the day when we're with you and we will love you perfectly forever. We long for that day, and until then, Lord, help us, change us by your spirit, make us more like Christ, help us to love one another and to love you. In Jesus' name, amen.